Listen to the conversation and answer questions one to six. Good morning, Country Comfort Albury. Oh hi, I'd like some information, please. I'd like to find a double room to stay for the weekend. What kind of rooms do you have? Well, we provide a variety range of accommodation depending upon your likes. The guest house room costs forty-five dollars per night. It provides air conditioning and shower, and a waterfront room costs eighty dollars per night. It has got its own balcony overlooking the foreshore of the lake. And we've got a kid. How do you charge for children? Extra bedding is available if you require that. If the kid is aged twelve and below, the cost is ten dollars per night for the guest house room and fifteen dollars for the waterfront room. Do you have a swimming pool, tennis court, or something like that? Yes, we've got a swimming pool, which is free for all the guests. But the tennis court charges eight dollars each hour, including the rent of rackets. How about other facilities? We provide free off-street car parking and internet access. We also installed in-house movies, but that costs four dollars per hour. Oh, we don't think we need that because of the kid, you know. We don't want him to see movies on the weekend. Well, we also offer ironing equipment in the room. That's useful, I think. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to go through the questions seven to ten. Now listen to the last part of the conversation and answer questions seven to ten. Great. Could you tell me the address? How do we get there? Yes, it's Country Comfort Albury, A L B U R Y, at six hundred and forty-eight Dean Street, New South Wales. Six four eight Dean Street, D E A N. Is that right? Yes. Well, I wonder what activities are available there in this season. You know, we want to have an indulgent weekend in the boring winter. Oh, you'll not get bored here. You know, Albury is the perfect base for alpine skiing. Besides that, winter's frosty alpine air encourages walks through mist-laden valleys. You can walk alongside rushing streams and waterfalls. After returning to the warm and comfortable lounge, you can sit by the open fire. I think this is the ideal time of year to nourish your body at the Salus Spa. The idea of skiing doesn't appeal to me very much, but it sounds good to have a relaxing walk through the valleys. Maybe after that, I'll have a massage and some soaking in the spa. And you know, this hotel is perfectly located in a quiet position off the main highway in central Albury. It's within walking distance of licensed clubs, restaurants, shops, and the central business district. It's known for its excellent cuisine and warm Australian hospitality. Good. It's a good idea to taste the tasty dishes in one of the restaurants. My wife may be interested in shopping. She's always keen on that. I think I'll contact you later. Thank you very much. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a conversation between a student and a driving instructor. First, look at questions eleven to fourteen.
Listen carefully. Hello, I'm going to be your driving instructor today. Are you ready to begin? Hi. Hope you don't mind. It's my first time driving a car. Of course not. That's my job. I teach people like you how to become a safe and responsible driver. So let's begin. Remember the most important rule of driving: safety first. There are some steps to follow. First, you should put on your seatbelt. You should always remember to do that. In case of an accident or emergency, having a seatbelt on is of utmost importance. Okay, I have my seatbelt on. Now, what should I do? Start the car. Good. Now make sure that the steering wheel is in the proper position, and that your seat is not too far or not too close to the pedals. I'm all ready to go. Should I shift into first gear? Don't forget to put the parking brake down. You don't want to drive with that up. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. If I have the parking brake on, I won't be able to accelerate. Yes, that's right. Now put the car in reverse and slowly back out of the parking space. Good. Put the car in first gear. When should I shift? Is it better to shift slowly or quickly? You can shift whenever you feel is appropriate. This means shifting should occur smoothly. Do not shift too slowly, or you will stall. Shifting too fast will waste gas. Shifting is simple. Just remember to shift smoothly. To shift, you will have to push the clutch and then push the gas pedal. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Remember, smoothly is the key to good shifting. Like this? Yes, that's good. Now keep it slow. Don't drive very fast just yet. Be sure to constantly check your mirrors for oncoming traffic. Always be aware of everything that is around you, including three important things. Remember these three. People crossing the streets, other cars, and bicycles riding next to you. What should I do if I see a yellow light? Well, it's always better to brake instead of trying to run it. But if you're travelling at a speed where it's impossible to stop in time, then you should try to make it across the intersection. But remember, you should always try to stop. It's the safest way to avoid an accident. Even if I have to brake very suddenly. Yes, even if you have to brake suddenly. What about if a driver behind me is going a lot faster than I am? You should always be ready to move to a slower lane if a driver behind you is forcing you to go faster than you are comfortable with. Never try to speed up to accommodate a faster driver. You could risk an accident or a speeding ticket. It's better to let him go. That sounds like good advice. Be careful. There is a sharp turn up ahead. Remember to brake before turns. Otherwise, you might flip over if your speed is too high going into a turn. Got it. I know that I should always try to observe all traffic safety. That's right. If safety is not your first priority, it will make driving very dangerous for you and other drivers on the road. Okay, park the car here. You did a great job today for your first day. I'll see you in three days. Thanks so much. I will see you then. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You hear a club leader giving information to a group of young people who are planning to do a two-week holiday course at the Tamerton Centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, everyone. I've been asked to talk to you this afternoon about next month's trip to Tamerton Study Center for the two-week course. Now, some of the things I'm going to say you may have already heard or read about, but I think it's important to emphasize a few key points. First of all, it's worth reminding you why Tamerton was set up in the first place, in the late 1960s. That was really before all the concern with preserving the environment, which everyone talks about these days. The idea was simply to get people out of the cities and into the country and to find out that just being outdoors can be very rewarding. This is not going to be a holiday in the usual sense. It's called an adventure course because you'll really be stretched to your limits, but that in itself can be a positive thing. The group I took last year, for example, said that although they actually felt pretty weak and exhausted all the time, <laughs> it really made them learn a lot about themselves and increased their confidence. And in the end, that's the most important thing. Now, all of you knew about policies at Tamerton before you signed up for it, so you know that in many ways it's quite old-fashioned. You don't have a lot of choice in what you do. But something which I think makes the place so special is that you get to try so many different things every day. For instance, one day you'll do climbing, and the next you'll be surveying rock pools. It's not intended that you become an expert in any of them. It's more like a taster, which you can follow up if you want. And there isn't a lot of free time. Organized activities and talks, etc., go on until 9 p.m., and lights go out at 11 p.m. There are table tennis tables with all the equipment and board games, though I have to say the pieces often go missing, so it's a good idea to take your own. There's a DVD player with a good selection of films suitable for this age group, so don't take yours. Bedtime at 11 p.m. is strictly enforced, and there's a good reason for this. You're all under 18, and we organizers need to know that all group members are accounted for in the house as we close for the night. And, of course, you'll be so exhausted anyway that you'll be too sleepy to want to cause any trouble. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now, what should you pack? The information sheet tells you a lot about what clothing to bring. But what about other things? Well, Tamerton House has its own small shop. But anything there is several miles away, so you won't have many opportunities for buying supplies. So in this last part of my talk, I'm going to explain what objects you should take with you to the center, what you can take if you want, 
and also, very importantly, what you cannot take. Several of you came up to me before this talk and asked whether you can take things like kettles or hair dryers. The answer is, there are plenty of these electrical appliances available in the center, and they are of the proper voltage and are checked regularly. Yours may not be, so the rules at Tamerton say you can't bring them into the center because it's considered a fire risk. Remember, it's a very old house. Now another question was about cell phones. Although you definitely can't have them on during inside talks, you equally definitely need them when you're out on exercises. So they're a must, I'm afraid. Anybody who wishes to talk to me about borrowing a phone for the fortnight, please see me after this talk. Now, the weather's heating up at the moment, and you'll be outdoors a great deal. If you wear proper clothing, especially a hat, sun cream is optional. Also, they sell high-factor cream in the shop, so you don't have to take any of your own unless there's a special kind you use. Now, there's a special note about things like deodorants, which come in aerosol cans. I need to tell you that these are banned in the center, because apparently they have the habit of setting off the fire alarms. If you want to take an aerosol can, you'll actually be at risk of being told to leave. And finally, people have been asking about whether they need to take towels. Well, the center does provide one towel per guest, which you're required to wash yourself. If you're happy with that, then don't bring another. If not, take one of your own. Just remember how much outdoor exercise you'll be doing and how dirty and wet you'll be getting. You might that is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You're going to listen to a talk about tea in the UK. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. During the 1930s, there was a popular song which had the title Everything Stops for Tea. And to millions of British people, a restful cuppa is still an ideal way to relax for a few minutes from the rigours of the day. The English custom of drinking tea has its roots in the 17th and 18th centuries. When first imported to Britain, the exotic cha, cha, or cha, as the Chinese tea was variously called, was considered a man's drink to be enjoyed with colleagues at London coffee shops. These were popular meeting places for many walks of life, politicians, lawyers, poets, actors, and writers. Many London clubs began in this manner and the famous Lloyd's Insurance underwriters started out as Lloyd's Coffee House. In 1706, the first coffee house that offered tea was Tom's Coffee House, owned by Thomas Twining. He realised that he needed to introduce an added attraction to compete with the many other coffee houses in London, and tea was rare, exotic, 
and extremely expensive. With these credentials, tea became an exclusive drink and enabled Twining to open a tea shop under the sign of the Golden Lion in the Strand. By the 18th century, the ladies of the more affluent classes were going China mad, using tea as an excuse for displaying their extravagant purchases of Chinese porcelain and Dresden tea sets. A comprehensive tea tray would consist of a teapot and stand, teacups and saucers, sugar bowl, milk jug and basin for discarded tea and tea leaves. Tea was still expensive and kept in locked tea caddies. Skilled craftsmen fashioned caddies of carved inlaid woods fitted with crystal and precious metals. To ensure the servants weren't tempted by this priceless commodity, the caddy was kept locked and only the mistress of the house held the key and prepared tea when guests came to visit. No well-brought-up young Englishwoman could consider herself socially acceptable unless she knew how to brew a proper cup of tea. As the 18th century progressed, changes in commerce and working hours resulted in the main meal of the day being taken much later in the evening. The prospect of lasting from breakfast until evening did not appeal to the Duchess of Bedford, who is usually credited with being the first to alleviate late afternoon hunger pangs by introducing a small four o'clock meal served with tea. With time, the light, wafer-thin toast or delicate white bread gave way to exotic fillings like tomato and egg, cucumber, chicken or potted shrimps, followed by buttered scones, crumpets or elegant pastries. The popularity of tea continued to spread, but it was not until 1839 that the first shipment of Assam tea, Indian tea was landed in Britain. A healthy trade with India was soon established, and tea clippers, like the Cutty Sark, now a museum in a dry dock at Greenwich, were reaching the peak of their sailing days. In 1879, the first limited shipments of Ceylon tea began to arrive, and by 1880, this had been firmly established alongside Indian and China teas, giving the broad range of teas that are available today. There have been few changes in three centuries of tea trading. London is still the centre, and indeed Twining still has a shop on the site of the original Tom's Coffee House at 216 The Strand. The name Twining has been linked with tea for over 280 years. Indeed, it was Richard Twining, in his capacity as chairman of the dealers of tea, who in 1784 persuaded Prime Minister William Pitt to reduce the high tax on tea, making the beverage more accessible to the general public. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.